Hi, everybody, and welcome back to U University. I'm Dr. Kelly. This is one of my ancillary videos, so it will be a little more on the chatty and personal side. So grab your knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving, or whatever craftiness you feel like doing, and sit down with me for a little chat. This morning, I attended an event for the National Society of Collegiate Scholars. One of my students nominated me to be a distinguished honorary member, and it's the nicest thing to be nominated by a student for this kind of recognition. It was a really lovely ceremony. I went up on stage with my student who nominated me, and she presented me with the award, and I'm wearing the pin that I got. So yeah, that was a fabulous way to start my day. I've been hearing from a lot of people that it's unseasonably hot where they live, but here it has been quite chilly. The seasons are definitely changing around here. We've got a lot of beautiful fall foliage going on right now. The farmers are all in the middle of harvesting the cornfields. Lately, it's been cold and raining a lot, and the other day we even had some snow flurries. I was not ready to see that. I've already had to get my winter coat out because it's been so chilly. Um, this past week we had fall break at school, which is just that we had Friday off. We don't get the whole week off, but a long weekend is always welcome. I got some papers graded and also did a little crafting. I made some cards and worked on a knitting project that I'll tell you about in a few minutes. This semester, I've been unusually busy at school, so I've really had to prioritize my time. Um, and that means I've spent more time working and haven't been able to record as many videos as I'd like. I also haven't been on social media very much, but now that it's midterm, I think things are gonna settle down a little bit. Uh, I had a lot of extra work at the beginning of the semester and I still have some of that going on, but not as much. So I'll keep posting videos as much as I can. I have so many ideas and topics that I want to do shows about, so I hope to get back on a regular schedule soon. Today I thought I would share with you some of my fall favorites this year. So I want to talk about some favorites that have to do with knitting, some favorite office supplies, and then I thought I would do a little review about my favorite spooky book, Dracula. So first let's talk about knitting stuff. A couple of months ago I came across this pattern for a quilt called Autumn Glory and it is a star quilt which are my absolute favorite quilt patterns. I have three or four star quilts that I bought from Etsy and I love them. Anyway, I don't do quilting myself but the beauty of this Autumn Glory pattern is that it's all hand knit. You knit a series of blocks, um, 64 blocks, that are about six inches square. And then they sew them all together. They are knit corner to corner, kind of similar to the grandmother's favorite dishcloth pattern that many of you have probably made. And they're all garter stitch, so the squares are super easy to make. Some of them are a single color and the, and others are half one color and half another color. Now this pattern calls for wool of the Andes yarn, which is a nice worsted weight wool yarn from Knit Picks, and it's not that expensive, but it's not super wash wool. And for a big blanket like this, I thought it would be kind of a drag to wash it by hand. So I went on a mission to find a replacement yarn that is easy care, and I discovered this Elysian worsted weight yarn by Cascade. It is 60% superwash merino and 40% acrylic. There's 219 yards in each skein. Um, this feels very smooth yet sturdy and it's not scratchy at all and it's machine washable and dryable. I ordered mine from Jimmy Bean's Wool and it was $9 a skein. So, and I think I needed 18 skeins. So it was around $160 total, which I know is not small change, but it is a big project. Um, I want to say it's around 54 inches square, the total, and 
If you wanted to use less expensive yarn, I know you can find some nice yarn in pretty colors at the big box stores where they have sales and you can use coupons to save money. So you could probably get the yarn for this project for less than I did, depending on what you wanted to use. You need eight different colors and the colors in the original pattern are definitely fall colors. Um, they're yellow, orange, red, browns and greens. However, I changed it up a bit and I decided to go with blues and greens, even though those aren't really fall colors. So the pattern comes with this handy schematic of how, the, how all the blocks are arranged when you put the whole thing together. So what I did was I traced that schematic and played with different color schemes and came up with something that I liked. And this is the color scheme that I'm going with. Although some of the colors of my markers that I colored this with don't exactly match the colors of the yarn, but it gives a rough idea of what the quilt will look like. The thing about coloring with these markers is that they're all quite bold colors and the actual yarn colors fluctuate between darker and lighter shades. But again, it's just kind of an approximation. So here's one block where you can see more of a contrast between the dark and the light. And here's another one. And then some are solid like this one. So again, so again, that pattern is called Autumn Glory and the designer is Suzanne Ross. And you can get this pattern on Ravelry for $3.99 and I think it's definitely worth it. Okay, I am knitting these blocks on some new needles I got from Jimmy Bean's Wool. And these are called Smart Sticks and they are a new release that's only available at Jimmy Bean's Wool. They're smart for a lot of reasons. First of all, they're color coded so that different cord lengths are different colors. So these are 16 inch circulars and the cord is red and then these are uh, 40 inch circulars and the cord is pink. The second yeah. smart thing is that the needle size is very clearly printed on the base of both needle tips. You don't need a microscope or magnifying glass to be able to see it and the printing is etched into the metal and is not going to rub off. Believe me, I have taken my fingernail and rubbed it across the printing many times to see how durable it is and you can't even tell. The printing is just as clear as it was when I got them. Now arguably the smartest thing about these needles is that they are marked in one inch intervals throughout the entire length of the needle tips and cord. And those one inch measurements are actually labeled right on the needle tip so that you can see that it starts with one inch, two inches, three inches, and four inches. So these are four inch needle tips. And then the markings continue onto the cord, although you don't get the numbers labeled on the cord. That would be really hard because the numbers would have to be tiny but the markings are permanently on the cord at each inch. And then on the other needle tip, the numerical labels resume. So on this one, you can see it picks up at 13, 14, 15, and 16 inches. Now, there are a lot of reasons to love having these measurements. First of all, it's a convenient measuring tool if you don't have a tape measure on you. You can also calculate wraps per inch of a particular yarn. You know, if you're trying to figure out the yarn weight, you can just wrap that yarn around a one inch segment on this needle and count the wraps per inch. And that will give you an idea of your yarn weight. I talked about yarn weights in an, a video earlier this year, and I'll link that below in case you missed it and are interested in watching that. So anyway, it's a nice wraps per inch tool. You can also use the markings to measure your knitting gauge. What a lot of people do is take four inches on the needle tip and count the number of stitches in that four inches to calculate their gauge. So pretty handy. What I love is that when I pick up a pair of circular needles, I always know what the length is. You always have the measurement right on the needle tip. For example, on this longer one, I might not remember 
is this 32 inches or 40 inches or what? And I know these are color coded so that the pink is always 40 inches, but if you forget like I do, you can just check on the needle tip and see 40 inches. So I always know what I've got and I love that. As far as the characteristics of these needles, they are basically the same as the Knitter's Pride Zings. They're made in the same factory. The needle tips are aluminum and have a fairly pointy tip. It's, it's kind of middle of the road as far as tip sharpness goes. The cords are nylon and have a good memory, especially on the longer ones. Um, right now I only have two fixed circulars in the Smart Sticks. Um, both are a US size 8, which is a 5 millimeter. And the 40 inch ones, as you can see, um, the cable has quite a bit of memory. I tried these out and wasn't a big fan because I found that the cord would get twisted and just be in my way. But to be fair, I didn't have the cord completely filled with stitches and that will probably make a big difference. So I actually got these 40 inch needles to knit the border around the edges of the quilt that I'm making. So I'll update you on how I like using them for that. Now the 16 inch cable I love because it doesn't twist and loop around. Um, so I've, I've uh, been very happy with this shorter cable. The joins on these are nice and pretty smooth. Um, I can feel a little bit of a hitch, but I've been knitting quilt blocks on the 16 inch circular and I've not had any problems with the yarn getting snagged or caught. The tips do not swivel on the join though, so if you twist your needles as you knit, you might have an issue with the longer cords twisting and getting in your way. Now, I didn't realize this when I bought them, but the needle tips come in both a four inch and a five inch length. Now on the 16 inch circulars, those are only gonna come with the four inch tips, but for the longer ones, you can choose either a four inch or a five inch needle tip. Um, these 40 inch ones, I got in a five inch tip, but you can get them in the shorter four inch tip. Overall, I think having the measurements marked in inches right on the needle tips and the cord is a fabulous idea and can be really useful. It's something unique that you're not going to see on any other circular knitting needles. The Smart Sticks also come in crochet hooks and sets of DPNs. And right now, you can pre-order Smart Sticks interchangeable needle sets for a discounted price of 10% off. I think through the end of October. The interchangeable sets will be mailed out on November 15th. So if you're looking for something new in knitting or a very nice holiday gift, check out the Smart Sticks interchangeable sets. There are two sets that I think just differ in the colors. One set is red and green and the other set is blue. They both have four inch needle tips and come with nine sets of tips from a US size four to 11 or 3.5 millimeter to eight millimeter. And there are five cords in each set. It looks like the regular price is $135, but you can pre-order them now for $121.50. So that's a little bit about my knitted quilt and my new Smart Sticks knitting needles. Okay, today I also wanted to share with you some office supplies and in particular, some pens that I've been loving lately. I recently placed an order with Jet Pens a couple of months ago and they have a great website where you can find pretty much any kind of pen and they specialize in Japanese pens. One thing that I love about Jet Pens is that they have sampler pen sets. Some of their sets are by color, like they have a purple pen sampler set, and one in turquoise, one in magenta, one in brown. They have sampler sets for left-handed people. They have a bunch of gel pen sampler sets. And I bought the gel pen sampler in the off-black set. In this set, you get 11 gel pens from various brands. 
And this set was off black, so they're not, they're not black, but they're close to black. So you have green, brown, gray, blue, red, you know, things like that. And some of these pens I had used before, like the Pentel Energel and the Pilot G2. But a lot of them were new to me, and I'm really liking playing around with them. One of my new favorites is this Pentel High Tech C. It is a capped pen that has blue ink and a super fine tip that writes very smoothly. Another one that I like is this Sakura ball sign that's very slim and kind of shaped like a baseball bat. It, it has brown ink and is retractable. These Sarasa um, clip pens are cool because they have a movable clip on them so you can attach them to clipboards and binders. If you're, if you're like me, I always end up breaking the ones with the regular clip on them like this one. And in this case, you get one in a gray blue and one in green. And these are retractable too. These Pilot Juice pens have a similar movable clip and they also are retractable. You get one in coffee brown and one in dark red and the ink on these is waterproof. And lastly, in this set, you get three of these Uniball Signo DX, which are capped pens in uh, lavender black, green black, and dark gray. Now in this set, the pens range from 0.38 millimeter tips to 0.7 millimeter tips. I found them all to write very smoothly, but most of them have extra fine tips in the 0.4 to 0.5 millimeter area, so they're not super bold if you're looking for that. Now this set cost uh, $25 for all 11 pens and it has been really fun to play with some new pens. Now, also from Jet Pens, I bought a new fountain pen that I really love. This is the Pilot Cavalier fountain pen with a fine nib. It comes in about 15 different colors and you can get either a fine nib or a medium nib. I like it because it is slim and elegant with a pretty pearlescent finish. The cap attaches snugly to either the top or the end of the pen so it doesn't slide off. It uses ink cartridges that are super easy to install and don't make a big mess of ink on your hands when you're changing them out. Plus the ink comes in a bunch of different colors like purple, brown, red, pink, and green, in addition to regular blue and black. This pen writes beautifully, it's very smooth, and the price is great too for a fountain pen. It's only $33.50. Now, if you are a real fountain pen connoisseur, Jet Pens has a whole selection of luxury fountain pens. Um, the most expensive ones I saw were around $600, <laughs> yes, for one pen. I don't think I'll be getting those, but the shipping was fast. My package came within a week of ordering from their office in San Jose, California. So I'm definitely gonna be ordering more pens for myself and for gifts from Jet Pens. Okay, so today I thought I would talk a little bit about my favorite spooky book that I've read many times. I usually read it in October in honor of Halloween. And the book is Dracula, the Bram Stoker classic, which was published back in 1897. Now, I've read it about six or seven times. And I, I normally don't go for horror fiction or vampire books. I don't even like scary books or movies. But I got into this book back in 2011 when Heather on the Craft Lit podcast was discussing the book. 
and they were just reading one chapter a week, and I found myself not wanting to wait until the next week for another chapter. So I ended up getting the audiobook on Audible. And then a couple of years later, I got to visit Romania and actually went to Transylvania and many of the towns and regions where the book takes place. Transylvania is a beautiful area ringed by the Carpathian Mountains. Now, this was not the original setting that Bram Stoker planned for Count Dracula's home. He was originally going to use an area of Austria, but he read about some superstitions and folklore from the Transylvania region where he'd never even visited and decided to change the locale to the more mysterious place. It's interesting to think that he'd never visited Transylvania when you read his description of the Borgo Pass in the first chapter of the book. It is beautiful and green, covered by a mountain forest. The, the pass itself provides open vistas of rolling hills with higher mountains in the background. It's not nearly as rugged as depicted in the book. At the top of the pass today, there is a hotel called the Castle Dracula, which capitalizes on tourists on the Trail of Dracula, but there's not much else around. Oh, and, and the Castle Dracula Hotel will actually stamp your passport. So, of course, I had to run in and get my Dracula stamp in my passport. Stoker was originally going to call his vampire Count Vampire, which just doesn't seem to have the ominous sound of Count Dracula. While researching his vampire novel, he came across the name Dracula. The source that he found said that the name Dracula means devil, which is not exactly accurate. Um, it actually means dragon. But Stoker was clearly attracted to the name Dracula as he wrote it down in his notes, which are now in the Rosenbach Museum in Philadelphia. Though Dracula is a purely fictional creation, Stoker named his infamous character after a real person who happened to have a taste for blood. Um, and that is Vlad the Third, or as he is better known, Vlad the Impaler. But other than having the same name, the two Draculas don't really have much in common, according to st historians who have studied the link between Stoker's vampire and Vlad the Third. When I was in Romania, I learned a, a lot about the real Vlad. He was a real ruler back in the 15th century, but he wasn't a count. He was more like a prince or a governor, and he was not a vampire. Um, he wasn't even the ruler of Transylvania, but rather of an adjacent province called Wallachia. The historical Dracula, or Vlad, is really fascinating, and there's so much interesting scholarly information about this book. Uh, one of the foremost Dracula scholars is Professor Elizabeth uh, Miller of Memorial University in Newfoundland, Canada. She's retired now, but has done a ton of research, and I'll give you a little summary of some of that information. All the writings that she studied come from the mid-1400s, and they indicate that Vlad called himself Vlad Dracul, where Dracul was a title that his father had received from the Holy Roman Emperor, the title Dracul referred to the Order of the Dragon. So Dracul means dragon. And members of this order were charged with protecting the royal family and Christianity, especially against the Turks. The area that we now know as Transylvania was a dangerous and tumultuous place at that time. They were regularly attacked by the Turks. And that's why practically every village in Transylvania has a fortified church. These churches were built with large protective walls and often several layers of walls around them so that when there was an attack, all the villagers would run to the church where they would were safer and could fight the enemies. So it was in this turbulent environment where Vlad was born. He was born in the town of Sigishwara, which was the, in the principality of Wallachia at that time. And his father was a prince or governor of that area. So when Vlad was around 11 years old, he was taken as a hostage 
by the Turkish Sultan to ensure that his father would support Turkish interests. He lived as a prisoner in Turkey for probably about six years, during which time he observed the cruel behavior of the Turks and learned all about torture and slaughtering people, especially by impaling. When he was finally released and allowed to return home, he found that his father and older brother had been murdered by the boyars or the local noblemen. So knowing Vlad's background, it's not surprising that he used the methods of torture and killing that he did, and it's not surprising that he used these methods on the nobles who had betrayed his father, as well as the Turks who had held him prisoner. Now, according to Romanian tradition, Vlad was a prince who repeatedly defended his homeland uh, from the Turks and put the needs of his country above all else and maintained law and order in difficult and chaotic times. He contributed to the building of a strong independent state and stood up against the powerful and traitorous nobles. Even in the 20th century, when Romania was under communist rule, Vlad was promoted as a national hero. Although he might have been ruthless, it was necessary under the circumstances, and the torture and killing were not much different from what other rulers in the world were doing at the same time. Now, you might wonder, where did the vampire myths come from? Well, although today everyone is familiar with vampires, this has not always been the case. The first recorded stories of vampires were not really known until the late 17th century into the 18th century. Katharina Wilson, a professor at the University of Georgia, notes that the earliest written description of vampire superstitions was in 1679 in England. The earliest use of the word vampire appears to be in France in 1693, where a newspaper reported cases of vampirism in Poland and Russia. Vampire stories had been around for a long time, stemming from ancient oral legends and superstition. But what brought vampire to the attention of the general public was a major vampire outbreak in Ser Serbia from 1725 to 1732. Many cases of people supposedly dying from vampire attacks were well documented by government officials who examined the bodies and wrote reports about the events. Of course, these incidents caused a widespread hysteria and people were reporting vampire attacks all over the place. In fact, in some locations, graves were opened at specific intervals to check for vampirism. It wasn't until the Austrian Empress Marie Therese sent her personal physician to investigate whether vampires were real or not that the vampire craze subsided. Her physician came back and said, no, vampires do not exist. So the Empress passed laws prohibiting the opening of graves and desecration of bodies. And this pretty much put an end to the vampire epidemics. A couple of interesting scientific scientific theories have been proposed to explain the vampire legend. The one that is most intriguing and has received scientific support was proposed in 1998 by Dr. Juan Gomez Alonso, a Spanish neurologist. According to his theory, rabies may have played a key role in the development of vampire legends. He says that he thought of this idea after watching a Dracula movie and noticing some similarities between vampires and what happens when someone gets rabies. Dr. Gomez Alonso also works at a hospital in Spain, and in his studies, he found that 25% of rabid men have a tendency to bite others. Rabies victims are also hypersensitive and intolerant of stimuli such as water, light, odors, or mirrors and react to these with spasms of the facial muscles um, and vocal muscles that can create hoarse sounds, bared teeth, and frothing of the mouth. 
and people with rabies usually live less than two weeks. Now, Dr. Gomez Alonzo's historical research also revealed that tales of vampirism often coincided with reports of rabies outbreaks. So the rabies theory can explain pretty much all vampire characteristics. So maybe vampires are real, but they're actually people with rabies. Well, that's a little bit of information about the Dracula legend, the real person who held the title Dracula and Order of the Dragon, and finally a possible scientific explanation for behavior that has been attributed to vampires. Just a few things to keep in mind when you're out trick-or-treating this Halloween. Well, that brings us to the end of today's video, and now it's your turn to leave me a comment down below. So what knitting or other crafting projects are you working on? Are you interested in knitting a quilt? And have you tried the new uh, Smart Sticks knitting needles from Jimmy Bean's Wool? And if so, what did you think? And what are your favorite pens and office supplies? <laughs> did you learn anything about Dracula? What's your favorite scary book? I always love hearing from you and enjoy reading what you have to say in response to my videos. So feel free to leave a comment, question, idea, or just say hi in the comment section below. As always, I'll include links to everything I talked about today in the information right below this video. Just click on show more to open up the box and you'll see all the links there. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today and I'll see you next time. And until then, stay smart and have a sparkly week.